Greetings, welcome, happy new year. This is Sunday, January 1 in the year 2023. And it's a bright day, it's not a sunny day, but it's opening. A friend of mine wrote this morning on her Facebook account that she has an amaryllis bulb that she hoped would bloom by Christmas, and it didn't, but she said it's up and the blossom is there and it's just ready to burst forth. <laughs> And, and that's what today feels like, is that it's ready to burst forth into the new year. We can make of it what we will. We can, we can, I had a colleague who used to say, make it a good day. And some days I was in the mood to hear that, and some days I didn't want to hear that. Like it was all somebody else's fault. But, um, but it's not. It's my day, it's our day to accept as we will and to make the most of The artwork that you have in the bulletin today, um, both of the pieces, both this one, the Annunciation, which I think, or the Birth of Jesus, um, Madonna and Child, I believe is in the Sistine Chapel. Um, and it is down here. It usually hangs right up there in the hallway. So that belongs to the church here. And on the back, we have a painting representing the flight into Egypt, which we'll hear about in a little bit as the morning goes on. And that also hangs on one of the walls here in the church. The others are mine, but I love the symbolism. I love the stories. I love in the journey of the Magi, how it's not just however many, three kings, Magi, wise men, whatever, um, hymn writers and and um, poets have sort of added details that aren't in the original scriptures. But then there's a whole entourage behind bringing the tents and bringing the food and bringing the emergency supplies and bringing the gifts. It's not just those three. So when they go to King Herod and when they go and find Mary and the boy Jesus, it's not just three of them. <laughs> there's a whole crowd that shows up. So... Um, I believe that that's just such a very poignant part of the story that we need to remember and imagine. Two weeks from today, we'll have our congregational meeting following worship. So I hope that you, your members, will be able to attend. We come in all of this history and also the history of the congregational people. So let us speak together the words of the Salem Covenant. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways, according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us in his blessed word of truth. You have an orange insert in your bulletins today. And on one side is the page with pictures of the manger and shepherds and um, a light voice speaking to Joseph or speaking to many of the people who were in this story. If you came to this place expecting a tame story, you came to the wrong place. And I'm gonna let you read the rest of it. Um, thanks to Quinn Caldwell who penned that several years ago. Um, but it gives you something to think about if your mind starts to wander while I'm chattering away up here or take it home and ponder it. But on the other side of that it, um, are two pages. One is a litany of darkness and light. One is a prayer of thanksgiving for epiphany. And we'll start with the litany of darkness and light. Let us read it responsibly. We wait in the darkness expectantly, longingly, anxiously, thoughtfully. The darkness is our friend. In the darkness of the womb, we have all been nurtured and protected. In the darkness of the womb, the Christ child was made ready for the journey into light. You are with us, O oh God, in darkness and in light. It is only in the darkness that we can see the splendor of the universe Blankets of stars, the solitary glowing of distant planets. 
It was in the darkness that allowed the Magi to find the star that guided them to where the Christ child lay. You are with us, O God, in darkness and in light. In the darkness of night, desert peoples find relief from the cruel, relentless heat of the sun. In the blessed desert darkness, Mary and Joseph were able to flee with the infant Jesus to safety in Egypt. You are with us, O God, in darkness and in light. In the darkness of sleep, we are soothed and restored, healed and renewed. In the darkness of sleep, dreams rise up. You are with us, O God, in darkness and in light. In the solitude of darkness, we sometimes remember those who need God's presence in a special way, the sick, the unemployed, the bereaved, the persecuted, the homeless, those who are demoralized and discouraged, those whose fear has turned to cynicism, those whose vulnerability has become bitterness. Sometimes in the darkness, we remember those who are near to our hearts, colleagues, partners, parents, children, neighbors, and friends. We thank God for their presence and ask God to bless and protect them in all that they do at home, at school, as they travel, as they work, as they play. You are with us, O oh God, in darkness and in light. Sometimes in the solitude of darkness, our fears and concerns, our hopes and our visions rise to the surface. We come face to face with ourselves and with the road that lies ahead of us. And in that same darkness, we find companionship for the journey. In that same darkness, we sometimes allow ourselves to wonder and worry whether the human race is going to survive. We know you are with us, O oh God, yet we still await your coming. In the darkness that contains both our hopelessness and our expectancy, we watch for a sign of your hope. Amen. Two lights that we light on our um, communion table each week signify many things. Signify, one, there was no electricity in ancient times, and so candles had to be on the tables. They were a constant source of light and um, drew attention to a community table, drew attention to where other people would want to come and see as well. So this draws attention to us drawn together on this day. It also, many people have assigned the meaning of Jesus' humanity and Jesus' divinity, of heaven and earth, of any other parts of, um, parts of our world that will help you understand by using light. Our scriptures tell us that Jesus was in the world before the world was jesus was with god in the beginning and and all things were created through christ so christ becomes a light to our world christ came as the light of the world christ came to be central among us christ came to bring light to all and no matter what um, insurrections against and crucifixion and taunting and stoning could not stop the light of the world from coming to us and being with us. So our Christ candle continues to shine as a sign of our reliance upon that light and of God's presence with us in darkness and in light. 
Isaiah tells the people, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your hearts shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, and those from Sheba will come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Words to the people hundreds of years before the painting that we have depicted here. Will you please join me in our responsive call to worship printed in the bulletins. We gather in the light that was before, is now, and ever will be. We seek the light's ancient wisdom. We gather in the light that is God's continuing gift. We live into the light's new wisdom. We gather in the light that is our own, emerging anew each day. We seek to share this wisdom, nurtured in the light from Bethlehem's cradle. Let us sing this psalm, this passage from Isaiah, and this hope. Hymn number 231, Arise, Your Light is Come. together in praying our prayer of invocation. God of light and love, in this very moment the star still beckons. Gather us and let the star call us to new ways of healing and hope, restoration and renewal, as we discover again Christ's call to discipleship. Amen. Our next word of truth that comes to us from God is from Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7 and 10 through 14. We know in this time that Christ is born and things are still happening about that. And as much as a baby brings an upending of the normal in any household, um, this baby has particular up upendings for actually the region around. This passage, again, is from a psalm hundreds of years before, before Christ was born, but with such good news and hope fulfilled in the birth of Christ. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. 
May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May the kings of Tarshish and of the isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings bow down before him, all nations give him service. For he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. The Magi followed the star, and we'll hear more about that precisely in just a few moments. But a hymn that celebrates that is, as with gladness, as this um, psalm tells us, as with gladness and rejoicing, we come and God comes to us. Hymn number 236. lights in the sky, omens, portents, dreams, and visions. From Matthew, we hear the story of the Magi. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born, King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. 
And Herod secretly called the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left by their own country by another road. We know that story through a hymn, author's words. Let us sing, We Three Kings of Orient are. It's hymn number 233. <laughs>
dead in Jesus' life suggests that the frankincense and the myrrh foretell a time of death for this child. Um, those are traditional embalming and burial elements. Um, it seems an odd thing to give to an infant at its birth, but it does tell the story as God has always given us um, stories and scriptures to tell. From Matthew 2, we continue. Now, after they had left, they being the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or younger, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. Let us sing a hymn, number 632, When Aimless Violence Takes Those We Love. Can you imagine? the heartbreak in the area when all infants and toddlers were killed on a whim by a jealous and fearful king. 632.
Jesus certainly knew all of those griefs and sorrows, also knew joy, also knew fear, um, gathering strength from those around him. When the passage that we just ended with all the children in Bethlehem in the area being killed, Joseph being warned in a dream, took Mary and the baby Jesus into Egypt to hide. And the scripture continues in Matthew 2. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Egypt, to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judah in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. In his two or three early short years of his life, Jesus has been in many places and has been on many people's minds and has had to, has had to hide as a refugee for the early part of his life and his family to hide him and to keep their identity a secret so as not to draw more attention and more fear to the people amongst whom they were living. We come to a time of sharing the sacrament of Holy Communion. And I've struggled with this for a long time. We've just had baby Jesus born. Why do we talk about his death? Why do we talk about his sacrifice? Why do we talk about the Last Supper? And yet our hymns have talked about that. And it is the reason that he was born on earth to show us how to love one another, to show us how to, to look at our differences in a new way and to accept those differences and affirm those differences and find ways that we can work together to bring peace and justice to this earth. So your invitation is printed. We'll read it responsibly. Um, it is in the bulletin. Come to your new year to be sustained by food and drink at this holy table. We come following the stars of guidance. Come in spite of all the detours of your life. We know God shows us every year, every day, an oasis of safety and rest when we are escaping from dangers all around us. And the home by another way which may be a new staying place or a new adventure. Come, for there is always a table waiting. We come to share what strengthens us and to receive the gifts of others. And so we come to a time when we can share our gifts, when we can share what has um, happened to us or perhaps what has happened through us the songs that we sing about Jesus knowing what it means to be on the earth, knows what it means to be perhaps a spoiled child, certainly um, a favorite among his parents until other siblings were born, and maybe even then, but knew also the jealousy of younger siblings, knew the confidence and the support of his very strange cousin, John the Baptist, knew what it meant to have a father die. We hear about Joseph in the beginning of his life, but not after. We know what it meant for him to have friends love him and then betray him, trusted people who sent him to the wolves, as it were. We know that he knows what it means to be human. He knows the value of a good meal. He knows a good laugh. He knows he knows the laughter of children and the curiosity of children can bring new light to us, even today. He knows what it means to be us. And so when he invites us to the table, he invites all of us, all of who we are and what we are, 
and what we have done and what we have not yet done. So we pray for those that Jesus loved most, those on the outskirts, those on the fringes, those who are not able to be fully a part of a worshiping community, those who are far away, those who are not able to attend through physical boundaries or mental boundaries. We pray for those who are ill, for those who are struggling to come back to help. We pray for those who are mourning, for those who need in this season of darkness to find the light, to know the light burning within them, to know the light that darkness cannot extinguish. We pray for those who are setting off on new journeys, for those for whom endings have come and what lies ahead is unknown, that they may know the light that leads them into the future. Oh God, you hear our prayers. You know our prayers. You are with us in darkness and in light. And God, in your grace, you hear our prayers. You've heard a lot of the story today. You've heard a lot of hymns today. You've heard a lot of what's been going on in your mind and in your heart. There are so many places we could go with this story today and look at the lives of the Magi before and after and look at King Herod and the people that he betrayed, the people that, that he brought destruction upon. We can look at the life of Joseph and the life of Mary, who we know lives even after her son does. We can look at his brothers and sisters and, and how, they, how they interacted with the Son of God being their brother. We can look at the disciples and how their lives were changed from before in their various jobs and responsibilities to their three years spent with Jesus learning and modeling their lives and their ministry after his. Where have you been touched today? Where have your thoughts been turning? Where have your sights been set? Let us join together in a few moments of silent prayer. Let us pray. Living God, you came among us to share our whole lives, our joys and our laughter, our fears and our dangers. You walk with us in all times, especially in times of trials and suffering. You call us to come into safety. Encourage us to trust that your love is wrapped around us even when we feel most frightened, most alone, most lost. Help us to comfort and to be comforted, to welcome and be welcomed, to shelter and be sheltered. As you have provided hospitality to us, may we offer it to others and receive it with grace and so enable all people to feel safe and at home wherever they are. God, we know how to do this because you sent your son Jesus to live among us as one of us, to teach us, to model us how to do all that. And so as we continue to practice our faith, let us speak together the prayer that he taught us and his disciples to say with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our words of assurance come from Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes 
to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made us a little lower than God and crowned us with glory and honor. You have given us dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under our feet all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thanks be to God for these gifts. Amen. Myron Chiribasi, you've heard her name here many times, has um, provided this insight into today's, today's communion, she calls it um, perhaps a movable feast. When Joseph and Mary even were in exile, of course they practiced their, their Hebrew faith. They practiced the celebrations and, and the holidays and the holy days, and they practiced the daily rituals. And so they, they would have practiced the Passover meal. They would have, have found other people who believed like they did and brought them together, even in Egypt, to do that. There are many places where people are experiencing a movable feast in homeless shelters, in stranded travelers, being in faraway airports or train stations or bus depots. We find people being brought into homes of strangers because we understand what it means to be alone and apart and lost. Our invitation to communion comes from this. Come to your new journey to be sustained by the food and drink of this table. We come following stars of guidance. We have said there is always a table waiting. And here we receive what strengthens us and we receive the gifts of others here. We remember that scripture tells us that people are fed along the roads of life. There is manna in the wilderness. Abigail's early DoorDash, well, that's another story for another time. Meals on Wheels, one innkeeper's unexpected kindness, and another's much later in Jericho for a Samaritan, inspiring the first warming shelter. But mostly we remember that final evening with his disciples when Jesus shared a meal with friend, betrayer, denier in a borrowed room under fear's shadow in the Passover tradition. So is bread and wine redefined as a promise to us and those we carry in the baggage of life that we pack for every road, both the tourism of life's joys and the paths we take through sorrow. This Holy Communion is the takeaway from all our stories on all our journeys. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 225, I Wonder As I Wander.
because God's gift to us are not all yet been given. As you travel from place to place, as you share meals in other people's homes, as you find other traditions and perhaps enjoy them for a time or perhaps adapt them into your own traditions, we find around the world so many ways that this sacrament is, is celebrated together. When I was in Israel, we visited the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth and saw in the walls around the sanctuary, in the walls around the the porticos and the walls around the central, the central gathering place outdoors, murals, pictures of the mother and the child, Madonna and the child from countries all over the world in, in mosaics and golds and carvings and oils and temperas. And it's just beautiful to imagine that Christ came to be who the people needed them to be. Most of our depictions of Jesus are of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, um, northern European child, which probably would have been hard to hide if you go to Egypt to hide and, and to blend in and to be one of the people unnoticed. So Jesus experienced many different meals with many different peoples and found many different elements. But what is common is that there is bread and there is drink many kinds of bread and in this day of gluten-free and vegan and all those we have many different ways to celebrate that as well today is new year's day we're still in the holiday season and so today we have pirellis which are beautiful star shaped um, delicacies that we'll share for our communion today reminding us of the light reminding us that there's joy and sweetness in this celebration together so even though it wasn't Pirellis, did I say that right? Pizzellis, that, that Jesus celebrated, we can, with rice cakes and with tortillas and with wheat breads and white breads around the world. Jesus met with his disciples and in the tradition of Passover had um, a flat bread, a quickly made bread without leaven in it to remind them of the, of the escape from slavery in Egypt. We celebrate today with these cakes. But what Jesus did was take the bread that was before them, and as our hymn suggested, redefined bread and wine. Jesus blessed the bread, and he broke it. And he passed it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, all of you, for this is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup, my understanding is that the cups are many and are always kept full at a celebration of the Passover. And so in abundance, Jesus poured out the cup and blessed it and passed it to his disciples saying, take and drink all of you. This cup represents my blood, which will be spilled for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. It is for the forgiveness of all. Each time you eat and you drink, do so in memory of me. Let us pray. O oh God, give us strength and courage. O oh dream weaver, help us cast our lot into the deep and refreshing pool of your unconditional grace so that we may become your next chapter of hope for all who hunger and thirst for the loaf and cup of shalom. So for all your paths in the new year and all the lights rising on your way home, take this bread and eat. And for every meal you share with others and every sip you need of hope, take this cup and drink.
God is a God of abundance. If you want a whole Pirelli, take a whole Pirelli or break off a piece if you will. If you'll turn again to the orange insert, the one page we haven't read yet is a prayer of thanksgiving for Epiphany. In response to God's infinite love and boundless grace, we rejoice to give thanks at all times and in all places to the one who created order out of chaos, who penetrated the night of sin with the light of the world and whose light cannot be overcome by human resistance. We thank you, God, living spirit, for sending a star to guide the wise to Christ. But even more, we praise you for signs and witnesses in every generation that lead us to your Christ. We thank you that Christ identified with sinners, preached good news to the poor, proclaimed release to those shackled by ignorance and prejudice and injustice and brought life and immortality to light by living the gospel life. We bless you for the gifts you have lavishly given us, though undeserving, for new definitions of power and wisdom, for disarming the principalities and powers, for removing the estrangement of sin, for inviting all to faithful discipleship, for promising courage in the struggle for justice and peace, for your presence in trial and rejoicing, for the sacrament of your extravagance, and for inviting us to dwell in your presence forever. Mighty God, we worship and praise you with magi and shepherds, apostles and martyrs. We sing your glory. Amen. And so how do we sing God's glory? We sing, we pray, we tell the good news to our neighbors and friends, to strangers. We offer up gifts, gifts of our time, gifts of our treasures. And so I encourage you to continue to be generous in that as you continue to support your local church, this local congregation, and the missions that inspire your lives every day. Out of gratitude for all that we can do, let us sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. God of vision, take these offerings of money and turn them into vision, visions of all people fed, vision of all people safe, vision of all people housed, vision of all people educated, vision of all people loved. Amen. And now we'll sing Jesus' life again as well in hymn number 242, O Sing a Song of Bethlehem.
come to the end of our worship, not to the end of our time praising God and giving thanks to God and looking to God to guide us with light through the darkness. In our benediction, we will read responsibly. We see the image of Christ, the hunted child. We are moved to oppose the paranoia of dictators today. We see the image of Christ, the refugee in Egypt. We are moved to provide sanctuary for the homeless. May we resolve never again to tolerate cruelty or neglect. We will live with tenderness toward all people. Through Jesus Christ, the compassionate one. Amen. Lord, let us know.